So in the five days leading up to the invasion, why, we were mostly all prepared up to that time. There wasn't much to do except that. And uh, we were ready to move out to a bivouac area. We were in this uh, family in this area, and it was unbelievably, uh, for myself, uh, it was the anxiety, the thing that we've been waiting for for a long time. Over the loudspeaker, I heard the word attention. I, with the other troops, snapped to attention, and in the corner of my eye, I could see two men, one wearing an American uniform, the other a British uniform. The American was General Eisenhower, and the other was Field Marshal Montgomery. General Eisenhower said that we were about to embark on a great cause, the liberation of Europe. God be with you. Montgomery said almost the same thing, but added that he was grateful for the help and supplies and troops from America. We left the marshalling area with full battle equipment, about 100 pounds per man. The harbor of Weymouth was crowded with ships of every size, shape, and description, most of them flying the stars and stripes. On the evening of June 5th, the harbor came alive. I could see one ship signaling to the other that this was it. We would hit the beach the next morning at 6.30 a.m. June 6, 1944, to be called D-Day. Around 0001 hours, June 6, I heard the roar of aircraft. I got up and looked out into the sky, and I noticed airplanes and gliders behind them. The 101st, 82nd Airborne, were being flown to be dropped onto the soil of France. I guess the morning, early, early morning of June 6, why everything started moving. Then we went up to, I believe, Bournemouth, where we assembled with hundreds and hundreds of ships. I've never seen anything like it in my life. And then I guess we were on our way. Chaplain Kelly, held a man's service on the, de um, on the deck of the, of the anvil in which he requested God to see us through the landing safely. We left the anvil on British LCA. The huge bluish-black waves rose high over the sides of our little craft and battered the boat as well as us with unimaginable fury. It was as if the waves were trying to crush our assault boat and we in it. We were all soaking wet. Uh, I tried to uh, keep my rifle dry by putting a plastic cover over the, uh, the rifle. We were so loaded down with equipment. Every man had at least one uh, anti-tank mine. And that uh, we had bundles in the door, bundles under the aircraft. And the C-47 was, was loaded to the point where he could take off, but he couldn't land with it, so he, so he had to drop it. But we had rendezvoused for quite a while to get the air of Amanda uh, in a, in a, in a, into a formation. And we crossed the, we crossed the English Channel. I was standing, standing in the door. We looked down, looked out, looked down, and it was the most beautiful moonlight evening. Looked down and had never seen so many ships in all my life and probably will never see them again. You could have walked across the English Channel. Not that you had to walk on water. You could just step from ship to ship. That is how, that is how it looked from the air. hard to describe. It was massive. It was massive. I can imagine being a German looking out through, a, through binoculars and seeing all this. <laughs> no wonder Hitler didn't believe him. The fury of the water broke our, our front ramp and the boat began to fill with icy channel water. But Lieutenant Donaldson rammed his body against the inner door of the ship and said, well, what are you waiting for? Take off your helmets and start bailing the water out. As the landing craft inched closer to the beach, shells began to explode around us. The craft 
next to us, hit a mine, and exploded. But as we were about to land, they had huge obstacles in the water. Big uh, railroad tracks crisscrossed, sticking up out of the water so nobody could get close. Was a, there was a ground fog, and we were supposed to be flying at about 600 feet. That was going to be our jump uh, altitude. We couldn't see any landmarks. We couldn't see see where we were, where we were, where we were going, or anything. But the uh, order was before we left that no one would come back in the aircraft, whether we found our object, uh, whether we found our DZs or not. That we would go out somewhere over Normandy. Just as soon as it bailed out, and I just knew that was the end of it, that I was, I was not coming back anymore, because I had never seen so many tracers in my life. Tracers all over the place that were shooting at us. I hardly got the, got the thoughts out of my mind when I went through an apple tree. My feet just barely touched the ground. The top of the, my canopy had caught my fall, and I just hung there real nice, no problem. Took my knife, cut myself out of my harness, and, and immediately started to gather the people together uh, that, that jumped from our aircraft. I saw the beach with its huge seawall at the foot of a massive 150 foot bluff. An 88 millimeter shell landed right in the middle of the LCA on the side of us, and splinters of the boat, equipment, and bodies were thrown into the air. The ramp was lowered, and the inner door was opened, and a German machine gun trained on the opening took a heavy toll of lives. I waded through the waist-deep water, watching many of my buddies fall alongside of me. I expected a bullet to rip through me at any moment from the right. I reached the stone wall. I looked down and being washed around by the incoming water, I saw the bodies of my buddies who had tried in vain to clear the beach. When we hit the beach, I knelt down and kissed the dirt, whispered, thank you, God. I then looked around and saw many dead in the water and on the beach. My company was being held up by machine gun fire from the hill. Then Colonel Taylor, regimental commander, got up and said, if we have to die, let's die on the hill. We moved out and took the hill, uh, giving the Allies a foothold in France. 